Amen. May be seated in His presence this morning. It's always good to feel the goodness of the Lord. It's right smack in the middle of August. During the height of the summer. It doesn't feel like it, but it is. So uh, many of our guys travel to go forth. But God visits us here every time. Aren't you thankful the Holy Spirit doesn't take, aren't you glad that He doesn't take a vacation? Amen. He's always on time, He's always present. If you have a Bible today, I will be looking in Psalm 37, and I encourage you to open there. I'll have the verse on the screen, but I'm going to refer to the whole chapter, the whole psalm, because of the beautiful things that it says in it and the theme of this psalm. I began preaching last week a new series on righteous. Everybody say righteous. Righteous. And so today I'm going to. Uh, we're going to start with this verse where David writes, I have been young. But now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. When I was first saved at age 17, I used to read this verse and it never really resonated because I was young. Uh, but now I'm old. <laughs> and so now I can read it and I can agree with the psalmist. I have been young, but now I'm old. But yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. And now that I have kids and grandkids, that really is powerful to me because it's a blessing even on my descendants. The righteous and the blessing of the righteousness is generational. Can you say amen? amen. And so, so I look at this verse and it's one of the gems in the Bible uh, and one worth memorizing out of the Psalms. David writes this, King David. That's the King David that if we read his history uh, in the scriptures from his teenage years, he was anointed by God to be king. Uh, and then we see his life until his death. And we see this David. This is the David that King Saul was jealous of. This was the same David who had multiple attempts at his life, even when he was faithfully serving in the palace. This is the David who was on the run, hunted like a wild animal. This is the David whose own wife was his critic. This is the David who at one time his own men were ready to stone him to death. This is the David who was cursed by Shimei. This is the David whose own son plotted against him to usurp the throne. Yet that same David writes this beautiful Psalm 37 where he contrasts the life between the wicked against the righteous and he sings of the blessings of the righteous. That same David, he pens the words, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And so I want to drop this thought in you. If you want to write it down, something to take home, and that is this. Righteousness works. Did y'all hear that? Turn to your neighbor and say, righteousness works. And, and I, I, I've been finding myself saying this to my kids every once in a while when we're talking about these things. And I just remind them, kids, son, daughter, righteousness works. And, and, and this is what we're exploring in this series. Now, if you weren't here last week, you can catch this on our YouTube or on our Facebook page. But a quick review is that we remind ourselves today that God himself is righteous. That means that God is right in all of his ways. In other words, he is all right. He puts the right 
in righteousness. Psalm 89 told us and tells us that the very foundation of God's throne is justice and righteousness. That means he is eternally, perfectly, persistently, entirely, thoroughly, completely, and overwhelmingly righteous. Without error, without flaw, without mistake, without weakness, without retreat, God is ever right. Can you say amen to the righteous God? And as a righteous God, we learned last week that God loves righteousness. And righteousness is a reflection of the character of God. And therefore, he loves not only righteousness, but God loves righteous. Any righteous in the house, say amen. amen. We're going to talk about it if you have a, a, a doubt of whether or not you're among the righteous. We're going to learn about that. But there's a difference, and I want to talk about the difference between righteous and righteousness. Now, righteous is a positional status. And righteousness is a lifestyle. And so we're going to talk a little bit about both. Because I want to make sure everybody in the house can leave here saying, I am counted among the righteous. Why? Because God's righteous, he loves righteousness, and he loves the righteous, and I want to be one of them. And so let's define righteous again. We talked about it a bit last week. Righteous are those who have been positionally made righteous by God. This is the new birth, being born again, being saved. You're not righteous by doing righteous deeds because anybody can do righteous deeds. An atheist can do righteous deeds. They can give to the poor. They can help out a widow. An atheist can, can, can run a soup kitchen. Atheists can, these are righteous deeds according to the Bible. But that righteous deed does not make the atheist righteous. Uh, before, but we performing righteous deed does not make us righteous, uh, positionally righteous. Being made righteous is an act of God. It's being made in right standing in his presence. It's a work of grace. It's a work of his mercy. It's made possible by the blood of Jesus and the work of his cross. It's a spiritual act. It's a spiritual positioning. And so get this. When you're born again, that is, you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, you repent of your sins, and you confess Christ, the crucified, buried, and resurrected Savior, calling upon him to save you, the Bible promises you shall be saved. And that's the born-again experience. And, and that's, that born-again experience is what makes you righteous because God in heaven, in response to the obedience of your faith, cleanses you from all unrighteousness, therefore presenting you righteous in his presence. That's positional righteousness. Have you been made righteous this morning? I'm asking you, church, if you don't know, I pray you know before you leave the building this morning. The righteous God is in the business of making unrighteous people righteous. And there's a bunch of immediate blessings that comes from becoming righteous in Christ. One, your appointment with hell is canceled. Every sin and failure of your past is washed away, never to be remembered again in heaven's court. Now you have the hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You're adopted by the Father as his son or daughter. You become an heir or a joint heir with Jesus Christ of the kingdom of God. You have a high priest interceding for you in heaven, Jesus Christ 
the righteous. You have a direct and open access to the throne of God in prayer. You are now part of the family of God, the body of Christ, which is the church. You, instead of floundering through life, you now have a purpose and a mission, and there are giftings and callings that are yours to receive and use for his service and glory. How about just be made righteous? Who wouldn't want all that? Amen. I'm glad God has made me righteous. That's why Romans 10 and 10 reminds us this. It's with your heart that you believe unto righteousness, and with your mouth you confess, and confession is made unto salvation. And I'm saying if you're not made righteous, if you haven't been born again, if you haven't been saved, but you believe right now, and you can ready to confess Christ, why not today? Amen? Let's just do it. Because there's blessings in being made righteous, but there's also blessings in being living righteously. So, so we need to remember something about this, guys. Uh, how many of you righteous say amen again? And if you know you're righteous, I want us to get down in our spirit the powerful blessings that come in being the righteous. Because when we start remembering who we are as the righteous and start believing what the Bible says about being righteous, we start talking like it, confessing it, walking like it, and the blessings that come to be made righteous, it will change how we think, how we pray, how we worship, how we serve. How we... Come on, somebody. Sometimes I think we forget that there's blessings in being righteous and there's blessings in righteousness. That's why David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. That's a blessing in itself. And even to your descendants, I have never seen the descendants of the righteous forsaken. If anything, mom and dad, be righteous for your kids. Be righteous for your grandbaby's sake because it, their blessings are, are, are dependent on it. Psalm 37 and 37 says this, Mark the blameless man, observe the righteous, for the future of that man is peace. There's peace to the righteous. The Bible tells us in Psalm 37, same chapter we started out here in verse 39 and 40, look at this. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. Look at this. Are you righteous, he says? Then he is their strength. In the time of trouble, and the Lord will help them. Listen to me, righteous. The Lord will help you. The Lord will deliver you. The Lord will deliver you from the wicked and save you because you trust in him. That's a word to the righteous. Someone worship God. Look what he says in Isaiah 3 and 10. I love this verse. Say to the righteous, say to the righteous at City Mission, it shall be well with them, and they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Anybody getting this down in their spirit? Because I think this word's coming alive and prophetic right now. Let me say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, and you will eat the fruit of your doings. Come on and receive and worship. That's the word of the Lord for somebody. The Bible tells us in Isaiah and also in Proverbs, he says this, he that, Proverbs 21 and 21, he that follows righteousness and mercy, he's the one that finds life and righteousness and honor. 34 and 19, I like this. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. That means just because you're righteous doesn't mean hard times aren't going to come. Just because you're righteous doesn't mean you're not going to have a blowout on A6. Just because you're righteous doesn't mean you're not going to have a jerk for a boss. Just because you're righteous doesn't mean you're not going to have bills that are bigger than your income. Come on, somebody. Just because you're righteous doesn't mean sometimes that you may not, the enemy might not try to afflict you with sickness. But here's what the word says. Many things come against the righteous, but the Lord, here's the promise, delivers him out of them all. Come on, somebody. That's the promise to the righteous. Now, 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 listen, even if the ungodly, there's a lot more in there. I'm just going to give you a little bit every week, all right? Is that all right? But is that enough to get you through the week? Now listen, even if the ungodly or the atheist or the untaught does righteous deeds or does what is right, it may not save them, but it still catches God's attention. Did y'all hear that? 
And in fact, I, I was going to pull that verse out of Acts where, where, where Paul even says, everywhere in every nation there are men that, 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 that do, do right and God recognizes this. Doesn't mean they're saved. Find that verse, somebody. And, and so, so all through Scripture, even if somebody wasn't made positionally righteous, they still, if they did righteous deeds, caught God's attention. Noah, Noah didn't have the law of Moses, and he didn't have the cross of Calvary. Yet, Genesis 7 and 1, God says, I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Abraham, he didn't have the law of Moses, and he didn't have the cross of Calvary. He was living in and around pagans. Yet, Genesis 15 says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. The Bible tells us about the book of Job and a man named Job who did not have the law of Moses. He didn't have the cross of Calvary, yet his righteous living calls God to brag on Job to the devil. Man, I wonder how much God brags on the, us to the devil now. And so, so he says to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him, perfect in integrity, fears God, turns away from evil. That's righteousness. In Acts chapter 10, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a Gentile, a Roman centurion living in Israel. Yet he was not born again. Yet he had a heart for God and he prayed all the time and he gave to a lot of charities. And it caught God's attention. In fact, in such a way that the, uh, Cornelius says, your many prayers and your acts of charity have risen before God as a memorial. He was not saved, but his righteous deeds caught God's attention. I'm not saying that they got saved because of them. I'm saying that because they are acts of righteousness, it catches God's attention. And righteous deeds, righteous acts, righteous living will catch the attention of heaven. How much more when the righteous are doing righteous? Y'all hear me? How much more when the righteous are living righteously? Because righteousness is living right. If you're writing notes down, that's a quick one. Righteousness is simply living right. Righteousness is doing the right thing. Righteousness is a standard of living, a way of life, a core philosophy of doing things. Righteous living is not possible without a clear moral definition, a clear sense of right and wrong, good and evil, holy and unholy. And so theologically speaking, righteousness is living in a way that mimics the righteous God. Now you write that down because we don't want to miss it. Righteousness is living that mimics the righteous God. And so we, the righteous, are called to live righteously. Everybody on board? Am I talking too fast? Uh, you can take, a, back in my day, we used to take a shorthand in, in school. and You could take notes real fast. I guess they don't do that anymore. Listen, look at Proverbs 11 and 18, guys. Let me take you all somewhere with this righteous thing. I'm talking about living righteously. Proverbs 11 and 18 says, He that sows righteous will have a sure reward. Right? Now, sow means to plant. And our brother uh, uh, Scott talked about it in the pulpit at offering last week about sowing and, and, and reaping. And we need to learn to plant. He was talking about giving and finances, which the Bible applies to that. But here he's talking about sowing righteousness. So if you sow righteousness out of that planting, you're going to eventually reap a sure reward. Now, this is a spiritual law we call the law of sowing and reaping. And so what we're learning here is that righteousness is a lifestyle that comes back to us in spiritual blessings. Because the law of sowing and reaping is attached to it. The law of sowing and reaping is a universal spiritual law that is true all the time and for everybody. Sinner and saint, unrighteous and righteous. 
Now, this is not karma. We are word people. This is a spiritual law of planting and reaping. Everybody with me? That's why Galatians says in 6, 7 through 8, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows or plants, he that which he will also reap. Any farmers in the house? If you plant corn, you're going to grow corn. If you plant wheat, you're going to grow wheat. If you plant uh, beans, you're going to grow beans. Whatever you plant is what you get back. Man, that's a lifestyle we need to learn again, the law of sowing and reaping. Uh, because we need to learn to strategically sow. That's why I got yellow squash growing up on my patio. Because you can't good get, get good yellow squash like we eat in Texas here. So I snuck some, I, I brought some in my suitcase <laughs> when I was home last. And I'm growing it on my patio. I strategically planted what I wanted to reap. Oh, come on. That's another sermon here. That's why I got pepper plants grown. Because every pepper plant I've ever, pepper I've bought in Germany is not hot at all. Even when it says hot. Even when it says it's very hot. It's not hot. So I'm growing my own peppers. I'm strategically planting what I want to reap. Y'all not getting this? And so here he's saying, whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. If you sow to, if you sow to the flesh, that which is carnal and fleshly and sinful, that's what you're going to reap, destructive things in your life. But if you sow or plant strategically righteous and holy things, then you're going to reap things which are eternal. I hope, you, I hope we're all getting this. Young adults, now's the time to get this. Because you got a lifetime ahead of you and you can sow some seeds right now that's going to help you reap good things later. Because there's a bunch of people my age that look 20 years older than me that sowed some bad seed and they're reaping. Come on, some. All right, I don't want to get off track here. But I want y'all to get with this sowing and reaping. So, so, so if you understand sowing and reaping, then, then we look at the law. Paul applies it to finances, uh, financial giving. If you sow into good soil, it comes back to you. Uh, and then he also talks about it when he comes to righteousness. You sow righteousness and you'll reap good rewards. God rewards righteousness. My question this morning to everybody is, what have you been planting? And what do you plan to plant from this day forward? Now, remember, we learned last week that Scripture tells us that when the righteous are in charge, the people rejoice. But when the wicked prosper, nobody's happy. That's my translation. Another verse says, righteousness exalts a nation. We want blessings. We want to be blessed. We need a revival of righteousness. So, so, so if we don't see the need for righteousness in our nations today, then we are in utmost trouble. And I'm thankful for you young adults in the house because I want you all to get this because this generation, your generation, needs to understand what righteousness is and be the next ones to carry that baton. But, but here's some obvious observations, um, you know, because we look around us and we have so been engrossed in politics as, uh, as if it is the answer. And, and I'm saying this on behalf of church folk everywhere, not just in America, but every nation of the world. It seems like you have uh, politics gone wild. And we think that somehow that politics is going to be the answer. Politics in itself is a system that necessitates self-promotion. It is an ever-shifting competition amongst players for power, influence, and control. And so it's a necessary evil because Paul even teaches laws and governments are from God because God is a God of government, order, and structure, and that governments exist to keep uh, anarchy from uh, existing. But, but here's the truth. Politics handled unrighteously is an ugly thing. And, and yet, 
we will find ourselves as the church looking to politics and government as an answer to man's woes. And we look through history, and there's all kinds of forms of government. You learn it in school. Communism presents itself at its root as justice and equality for the working people, and that sure sounds righteous. But history tells us that no communist nation has ever existed that has ever seen that reality, nor has one existed where there has not been extreme oppression, loss of dignity and rights as well. Socialism presents itself as a system that looks out for the collective well-being of all. Yet there has never been a socialist government anywhere where poverty did not prevail over prosperity. All We all look at capitalism, especially in the West, and we present capitalism as prosperity through free markets and free enterprise and opportunity for all. However, if left in the hands of men, it also provides no bridle against corruption and greed. Therefore, covetous and materialism often prevail. So look around us. What political party has not been exhibited by corruption and scandals? After all, what has government have in history done? It was government that made laws declaring a person being less of a man. It was government that passed laws uh, that certain races of people should not exist. It was government that declares certain faiths and religions as being illegal. And now look around us. We see governments using political spin to divide and polarize, turning one citizen against that citizen, producing constant infighting and incivility on the main street. We ought to step back and look and recognize through the eyes of the righteous that nothing is righteous in that. And yet we find ourselves thinking that this government or that party can legislate righteousness and they cannot. And once in a while, don't get me wrong, once in a while a righteous law is passed. Once in a while a righteous person sits in the seats of Congress. Thank God and we need more of it. And once in a while righteous people get in the council of governments. God help us raise up more. We ought to be active in this. But listen, it seems though in the process we no longer know what righteousness looks like. What we need in this generation is the righteous to sow seeds of righteousness. And it is the church that is called to sp spread the seeds of righteousness, not the government. This is all right. It's our job. How much time? I, okay, good. See, let me address something is uh, the obvious because we're talking about righteousness and, and what that means. And let me get something out of the way ahead of time. Righteousness often is looked at as sin-free living. And let me say amen, amen to the amen. Righteousness is sin-free living. Can you say that? Amen. And I know we don't hear that preached a lot uh, because we want to just overlook everybody's sin and include everybody and, 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 and so forth. But, but righteousness does involve sin-free living. But, and we want to define righteousness as living sin-free. And, and meaning not committing acts that the Bible calls sin. Sexual immorality, theft and lying and deception, murder and hate, drunkenness and getting high idolatry, sorcery, and the occults, slander and wrath and unforgiveness. You can look them up in the scripture. They're plain. And so we say we're not living in the sins, and that is a righteous way of life. Fact, we call this holiness. And uh, y'all still believe in holiness around here? Living a life that is holy involves the avoidance of sinful practice. But let me say this today, guys. Righteousness must be more than what we do not do. Righteousness has to also be what we are doing. 
And I want to talk about that because this is where I'm going to go. Right living involves doing that which is good. It's not just not doing what is bad. So you can write that down unless it's in your notes. Right living involves living that does good. And let me give you today's aspect uh, of righteousness because I have another aspect of righteousness to lo look at next week and, and the next. But today's aspect of righteousness is doing that which is dear to the heart of God. God calls this righteousness. And if you look through the Old Testament and New, you will find God has a very specific connection to the poor, the widow, the fatherless, and the stranger. And stranger means foreigner or migrant. If you look through the Bible, God specifically refers to this group over and over and over and over. In fact, if you really look at the times when Israel was in bad standing with God, God will give them a list of their indictments of sin. And he will always, of course, mention that you, you know, you're worshiping idols and you're, and you're doing this uh, horrible things out in the wilderness with these idols. But he always will say this, and you are guilty of neglecting the poor and oppressing the widow, and oppressing the fatherless, and mistreating the stranger. You forgot that you were all of the above, and it offends me. Woo! That's what God does. In fact, it's such a big deal to God, and, and, and there's a reason for it. In Psalm 68 and 5, he says that God is a fatherless, a father to the fatherless, and a defender of the widows. And no wonder when the widow is oppressed and the fatherless are oppressed. It, God rises up. Hey, I'm their protector. It's a big, big deal to God. In Isaiah 1 and 17, here's what he tells the Jewish nation that has backslid and are about to get carried off in the captivity because of their sin. But God says to them, and you can go read, read he goes, come on, let's reason together. Israel, come on, sit down. Let's, let's talk about this and negotiate. Because if you do the right thing, then, then you'll live right. If you, if you repent and turn to me with all your heart, everything's going to be all right. And then he says this, and if you learn to do good and seek justice and rebuke the oppressor and defend the fatherless and plea for the widow, he says, you'll please me. Are y'all getting this this morning, guys? It's a big deal to God. Now, 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 Isaiah, in Isaiah, one of the telltale markers that Israel had backslidden was they were oppressing the poor, the fatherless, the widow, the strangers. And I didn't throw this in, but I'll, I'll put it in now. And, and shedding innocent blood. And Jeremiah, once again, read Jeremiah, God's indictment against Israel, the same thing. You're oppressing the poor, you're oppressing the widow and the fatherless, you're oppressing the stranger, you're shedding innocent blood. In Ezekiel, he does it again. In Malachi, he mentions it again. Come on, this is something big to God. In Proverbs, Proverbs gives us admonition over and over and over against the oppression of the poor, not taking advantage of them or making their lives more difficult. And then Jesus comes and he rebukes the religious leaders who like to make long, fancy prayers to be seen while neglecting and oppressing the widows. And then... We look at this in the early church. One of the very first ministries of the early church were offerings that were divided to take care of the needy amongst them and the widows. And that's why James comes around a few decades into the church and he says this. You know what pure religion, righteous religion looks like before God the Father, the kind that pleases him? It's this. Visit the orphans, that's the fathers and the widows in their trouble and keep yourself holy. There it is in a nutshell. If we're doing, come on someone, this is New Testament and Old Testament. That God looks for the church, the righteous, to minister and care for these particular that are part of his heart. Now, I love this passage, Matthew 25. I'm talking about doing righteousness. Here's what Jesus gives us. Now, I want you all to understand that Matthew 25 is an end time passage. 
He's already gone in Matthew 24 and explained the signs of the end times, Antichrist, war, destruction, uh, so forth, tribulation. And then in 25, he gives us some parables. He talks about the ten virgins. We talked about that Wednesday night in Bible study in Revelation. Then he talks about the parable of the talents, again, distributing gifts to the church and we being good stewards, and increasing and multiplying that which is in our hands. Then he gives this parable about judgment day. And in judgment day, Jesus gives us a criteria of a measurement of righteousness. How do I know? Because here he is on the throne and the Bible says he separates on his left the unrighteous, and on his right, the what? Say it out loud, the righteous. And then he gives a powerful demonstration of a future day of judgment where he describes what the righteous were doing. And here's what he says. Come, you blessed of my father, that's to the righteous, come inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Because I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was a prisoner, and you came and visited me. What's Jesus doing here, guys? He didn't say, oh, come on, you righteous. You planted 20 churches. Come on, you righteous. You sang in the choir and had me standing up applauding. Come on, righteous. Y'all hear me? You gave so much tithe into the church, you almost made me look bad. Come on, righteous. That's not what he's saying here, is it? He says, righteous, come on in. Because here's what I saw. You were feeding the hungry. You were clothing the naked. You were housing the homeless. You were visiting the sick and ministering to them. You were visiting the prisoner and giving them hope. That is what righteousness looks like, church. And it is a big judgment day criteria. Ooh, y'all go read this. My favorite, one of my favorite passages I call this the least of the brethren ministry. Because this, this is what Jesus says. He says, when you're doing these acts of righteousness to them, you're doing it to me. This is why I say this is high work. I know y'all have heard, y'all have heard it sung. People say it in church uh, that the highest praise is hallelujah. You ever heard that? Give the Lord the highest praise, hallelujah. There's no Bible to that. It's a nice, cute song. It's not the highest praise. There's a lot of other things. In fact, Scripture directly talks about being high praise. But I'll tell you what the highest praise is. And that is when we are doing acts of righteousness to those who are dear to the heart of God, the hungry, the poor, the widow, the fatherless, uh, the homeless, the stranger. Because Jesus says, when you do, you are doing it directly to me. Meaning there's nothing more intimate, nothing more direct as an act of worship directly to Jesus than when you go do righteous deeds to this population. Y'all with me? I got seven minutes and 14 seconds. Listen. Let me ask y'all this this morning. Where are we? Where are we in strategically, actively ministering to this population that is to the heart of God? It's righteousness. And it's really not that hard, church, for us to adopt this heart of God uh, and to be proactive. In fact, you could leave this building today before we leave and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give us spiritual eyes to be able to see those around us who may be in need. And really on a daily and practical level because it should be the lifestyle of the righteous. So years ago, probably 25 years ago, I, I, I was with a fellow minister who was on the mission field uh, for years and did a lot of homeless ministry and train station ministry and bus station ministry. And, 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 and so it was his lifestyle. And I was still a young pastor. Uh, and he and I had pulled into a 
a mini mart store to grab something to uh, eat for the road, and I don't remember what else, some drinks. And I, I went in, and I got what I needed, came out and got in the car. And then he came out, and I was watching. As he came out, he had what he had, and he had another bag. He turns over to the right, walks to the corner of the parking lot, and he hands the bag to a apparently homeless man that was standing there looking very strung out and desperate. And he gave it to him, held his hand, said a blessing over him, and then got in the car. And the Holy Spirit got on me and said, you walked past him and didn't see him. He saw him. And I felt horrible that I did not see him too. And I asked God, help me to never not see that least of the brethren, anywhere I go, and, and God really used that moment. And this is what we have to do as a church. Don't let us walk out and not see the ministry that is in front of us and the opportunity to do an act of righteousness. See, A few years later, five, six years later, when I was driving back and forth into the city of Houston for school, uh, I would often sit at lights and in Houston at the time, probably still, they had those guys that stood at the red lights with the sign, you know, hungry, uh, need a meal, you know, whatever, and want you to give them some. Sometimes they're cleaning your windshield and, and wanting an offering. I was on my way home. I had, sometimes my wife would pack me a lunch if I was there all day long and I had my bag, and I had a couple things in it, maybe an apple, I can't remember. And I was at the light, and I could see out my peripheral, there was the guy sitting there. And you, they're everywhere, and, you know, I almost never gave money uh, because a lot of times, you know, these guys are alcoholics or drug users, and you think in your mind, well, you don't want to supply them drugs. But I had that apple, <laughs> And I know I could have given that apple to somebody, and he was at the corner of my eye. And right when the light was about to change, I turned and looked at him. And he was, a, he was an older, skinny uh, black guy. Not as old as you, Anthony, but a lot skinnier. <laughs> and he was sitting like this, weathered face, graying hair, hardened. When I looked up at him, he smiled the biggest smile that one could muster. I'm talking about like he had recognized me and was happy to see me. Big, giant smile. He wasn't even on his feet. He was sitting. He wasn't at my door but knocking on the window for money. He was just sitting there like this. And the light changed, and I drove off, but his smile would not leave me because the Holy Spirit hit me said, you just looked into the face of Jesus and you drove off. And I never, that haunted me for weeks, even for months, and even today I preach it and I still get emotional because I knew that was a God moment. God uses those kind of things to shape us and teach us how we should walk and how to live righteous and how we should be in ministry. And, and I, I looked at his big smile. He said, you looked in the face of Jesus today and you did not you drove off. And I went the next day, and I said, I hope he's there. And every day I went to that light, I looked for him. I never saw him again because I wanted, I had some stuff for him. Every time I went, hoping to see him, to give him some food, and I never saw him again. And it bothers me. A missed opportunity. And my challenge to the church today is, don't ever let us walk past Somebody in need that needs an act of righteousness that may not cost us a dime. Don't ever let us not see the face of Jesus in those who God holds dear to his heart. Because it is up to the righteous. God's counting on the righteous to do righteous acts to them. Because he defends them and he loves them and he wants to love them through us. Righteousness. My wife could come, come to the, I was about to say the organ. We need the organ. Come to the piano. Listen. 
I say this. Idealistically, in my last 54 seconds, idealistically, if every congregation in any town, village, or neighborhood strategically were reaching out to this population and meeting their needs, righteousness would prevail. In fact, it would be the kind of righteousness that is felt. Ooh, we need righteousness that is felt by the community. Stand with me, guys. I, that's, I was about to preach another sermon right there. Righteousness that is felt. I didn't preach it. I don't have a sermon, so you can write it down and make it drone. Righteousness that is felt. I'm challenging every one of you. Here's my challenge to the church. Walk out these doors and go do righteousness and target that population that is true to the heart of God. And I'll say this collectively at City Mission, we, we do have strategic focused outreach to this population. If you don't know that and you're new, we have a food pantry that needs to be restocked desperately for this before summer ends. And we give out food bags to those. We, we do bread ministry that will restart in September and every other week we collect bread, put them in bags, and we take it out to the community. And we have clothes pantry. And, and as people need, they call us. We give them what they need. And then once every other month, we open the doors to the community to come in with their families and get the clothes they need. So listen, we're, we're, we as a church, I'm so thankful that was in place when I got here because my mind was, if they didn't have anything like that, I have to start it from scratch. But no, it was here and it is part of who City Mission is. So I invite you, it's doing acts of righteousness. It doesn't make you righteous because you're righteous involved in any of that uh see anthony uh, 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 he's he, he heads over this ministry and in september we're restarting it but you can be part of that and there's an empty food donation box right there with like three items next week you could have it filled to the top because you're you're reaching the population that god loves but this is not a, a shameless plug. This is just saying, hey, we're doing stuff, and you have an opportunity to be part of it here as well. But I'm asking you, lift your hands with me right now. Say this out loud. Father, give me eyes to see. Don't let me pass one who needs an act of righteousness and mercy and compassion. Give me spiritual eyes to see the face of Jesus. In every gl glance I make, and every face I see, send us now, Holy Spirit, to go spread righteousness, righteousness that is felt. In Jesus' name, give the Lord the praise today. Give the righteous God the praise this morning.